and the curator at the Cape Cod Community College. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you want to ask a question to our speaker, please type your question by using the chat button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Your questions will be answered at the end of the event. So today, Higgins Art Gallery is here to welcome you during this time of uh, difficult isolation. Check our website for future exhibits because we love to see you and we want to see what you are creating behind the screen. We have a wonderful exhibit. Earth Justice is a group show about connectivity, vulnerability, inclusion, resiliency. Together, the artists are creating a non-violent movement for climate action and social justice. The gallery is also starting a virtual march for our students, for faculty members and administrators. So you can take a selfie and hold your creation or hold a banner and you can basically march virtually for earth justice. Unfortunately, for personal reasons, Tony Khan will not be speaking today, but he is in the room watching the event. He conveys his apologies. Some of you might be wondering who Tony Khan is. So Tony Khan is a public radio and television producer, the former host of PRI's international news program, The World, a panelist on NPR's quiz show, says you, and producer of Blacklisted, the national award-winning NPR series on his family's 15 years under the Hollywood Blacklist. If people want to hear or see more of Tony's work for public radio and television, you can visit his website at www tonykhan.org and Khan is K-A-H-N. Tony was with us on Tuesday during rehearsal and what was said reminded him of a, a humorous piece he produced years ago for Morning Edition. Tony would like to share it with us. Let's listen to it. Seats, please, ladies and gentlemen. The global auction is about to begin. Thank you. Item number one. The Amazon Rainforest, a prime piece of Brazilian property with excellent development potential for pharmaceuticals, scientific research, and uh, <clears throat> slash and burn real estate development. <coughs> open the... <coughs> Open the window there, will you, Raymond? <laughs> Thank you. Well, shall we begin at 20 billion? Do I hear 20 billion? There in the corner. Thank you. 30. Do I hear 30? Thank you, sir. 35, 35. Do I hear 35? 30. 40. Do I hear 45? 45, 45. Do I hear 50? 50, 50. Do I hear 55? May I remind you, ladies and gentlemen, the rainforest comes with its own fleet of bulldozers for sectioning and shipping. 60. 60. Thank you, madam. Do I hear 70? 70. Do I hear 80? Do I hear 75? This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The rainforest will not be renewed. I'm going at 70 once, twice. Sold for 70 billion to the conglomerate in the corner. Bring in the next one, will you, Raymond? Item 417, the atmosphere. Lovely to look at and a wonderful storage center for your extra ozone and hydrocarbon emissions. This is a genuine antique, ladies and gentlemen, in remarkably good condition considering its use. I'd like to start the bidding at a hundred billion. Do I hear a hundred billion? Do I hear 95? Do I hear 90? 85? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the atmosphere. We breathe this stuff. Do I hear 80? Do I hear 75? 
do I hear 50? It's not a Van Gogh, ladies and gentlemen, I know, but the pride of ownership alone is worth at least 45. I'll give you 20. 20 billion? Do I hear 25? Ah, 20 once, 20 twice, sold for 20 billion to the gentleman in the rear. Item 982. The Earth's Weather. Thank you, Raymond. Endlessly intriguing and a wonderful conversation piece. Uh, you'll observe it's even changed since the start of this auction. Note, if you will, the rising winds from the greenhouse effect and the unexpected southern cold spell from Chilean strip mining. Oh, look, ladies and gentlemen, a tornado. Let's start debating at 10 billion, shall we? Do I hear 10 billion? Yeah, I'm sorry, madam. You'll have to speak up. Uh, close the window. Raymond? I can't hear a thing. Whoa! Uh, don't panic, ladies and gentlemen. Just a, a little rising tide from the melting polar ice caps. Please, please, stay seated. Ladies and gentlemen, we've barely begun. We still have the ionosphere to go and the mineral rights to the moon. Please, everyone, what are you so scared of? So this piece makes me want to laugh and cry at the same time. Let's go and, and talk about Earth justice. I would like to introduce you now to the co-curator, uh, Ariet Jerusha Korim, also known as Jerusko. And this exhibit couldn't have uh, been without her. Uh, Ariet, you are a multimedia artist, you are an activist, and you like to use the name artivist to describe yourself. You are a mother of nature-loving artists, you are a musician, a songwriter and composer, and you perform with the Beat Greens and the Down to the Wired Choir. I also, you also co-founded Art Peacemakers and Cape Cool, and you have been a Welfician since 1984. So uh, thank you, Ariet, for accepting my invitation and bringing this diverse, eye-opening and evolving exhibit to our community and to our college. Uh, so while we were preparing the show, Ariet, I, I was watching you. Every day we talked and every day you were, you are in communication with artists that are activists you kept and you keep harvesting more peace and action against climate change. And the result is this beautiful exhibit with 41 visual artists and several musicians, and the number keeps growing. So even this morning, you texted me, I sign on to bring Ben to expand the show. <laughs> so Ariette, uh, welcome. and. Um, Tell us more about uh, the exhibit and also about what you, what you do in, in this world. Well, um, I do a lot of kinds of art, but my, my uh, um, this is in French, uh, mon métier, c'est l'amitié. What I really love to do is, um, is to make friends. It's, and it's something that a lot of skills I learned from my parents who were immigrants and, and made their way, um, making a lot of connections. And I see in the, among the viewers, some of the people that knew my parents actually. Um, and I feel like art making is a very solitary thing, which, and I love the solitude, but I feel like it's also necessary to share it. And in sharing it is a social thing. And whether it's everyday art that we all make, of like making the meals for ourselves and our kids, or, or whether it's um, uh, lullabying a child to sleep. A lot of us don't know that we're artists, but we are artists. Um, and some of the most moving parts of the show to me are the, are the, um, the Wampanoag uh, artists who, who have shared their work uh, in one case with Julia Martin, who unfortunately was, who was planning to be here but couldn't be, um, she has stitched together um, not only her father's stories, 
but the story of her of four or five hundred years or more of the history of the Wampanoag Nation in these extraordinary uh, wampum belts um, and the first the first the uppermost ones are of the the uh, ancient ones and their home sites the third one down you'll see um, the clipper ship, which could be the Mayflower, could be other ships of, of um, folks coming from across the ocean. And, and, it's, and the third belt is called War, Plague, Slavery. And the third belt on the bottom is called Powwow Time. And Julia Marden is not only a grandmother and a prolific artist, but she's also a powwow dancer. And um, the, the resurgence of indigenous First Nation people in this, that's happened through gatherings like powwows, in a way what we're doing today is kind of a virtual powwow of sorts, but, but through, it's, it, it's, it's celebrating the culture as it is now and, and the promise for the future. So I just wanted to, to um, be here to witness a little bit for, um, for Julia, but there'll be hopefully more from her showing the details. A lot of, a lot of, the, a lot of the imagery um, relates to the clans um, within the tribe and the symbolism is a language, you know, the Wampanoag language is now being revived thanks to a lot of wonderful um, people who started a school of uh, language rec reclamation. But a lot of this language is very visual language and a lot of the, the, the work of a lot of um, people who do art that has been dismissed as craft and as you know, ethnic curiosities and stuff is really, there are messages in, in, in this work, which is predominantly women's work, not all the time, but anyway. So that's, I wanted to say that and these are these are um, the the uh, wonderful round, uh, twined round bag um, on the right. The um, is is a based on a story that um, Julia's father Willard told her about his experiences um, uh, sword fishing, and the story ha has the you have to turn the bag around to see the end of the story, but. Um, it's sort of like something out of Moby Dick, and we will have definitely more stuff about Julia. The embroidered jacket and sneakers are one of her granddaughter, her grandchildren's, and the, the designs that she's painted on them are hundreds of years old. And I thought it was just so beautiful about the continuity of passing on her inheritance, her father's stories, and her tribal um, art, to you know it, it just you know her work blows me away she's on facebook she has uh, julia martin and she also uses the name blue jays visions so i don't want to talk too much about one individual artist because there's so many we won't get a chance to and i want to have a chance for the people who are here to talk um i'll just say a little bit that uh there are also four ghosts artists there are 70 pieces more i think 70 or more pieces in the show representing the work of 40 artists from four corners of the of the united states and beyond uh, all ages and um uh the four ghosts one of them is very personal to me and there's a piece a beautiful piece that was behind julia's basket um or round bag uh that is the work of of uh of a, a friend to, to many of us, Pat DeGroote, who, who, who died a couple of years ago, but who is very present with us right now in this show um, and was a tremendous lover of nature and, and, uh, and justice. And uh, Cheryl knows a little bit about one of, one, of the, one of the artists whose work is represented. I don't know if Tom has this, this image, but it's... Um, it's a, it's a photograph by Julius Lester. Did you want to say something about Julius, Cheryl? You get unmuted. <laughs> oh, you're, 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 you're muted. 
Well, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm unmuted. Cool. Well, Julia Lester was a very interesting um, person who I only knew um, from um, him being the cantor at a synagogue that I was involved in in Northampton when I was living in Conway, Massachusetts. He was also a professor at um, University of Massachusetts, and he had the most beautiful voice. <laughs> um, and it was extraordinary to hear him in synagogue because it was it was really kind of transformative to and to see the man and then hear this this voice that that filled the synagogue was just um, really, really beautiful. What, what, what Julius had in common with one of the other ghosts is that um, both he and, um, and Matt Heron, who was the photographer who, who took the beautiful image of, of Martin Luther King and John Lewis and a lot of other people singing and using art, the art of music, as a huge part of the civil rights movement. Matt and Julius both worked for SNCC. They were both photographers for, for SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And, um, and, and Julius's job also was as a singer to help lead songs when people were scared to have to go out the next day. He would lead people in a song um, uh, as part of the, that was his job <laughs> in the meetings before actions. <laughs> I'm so, thinking. I'm thinking, Ariette, it would be good to watch the movie because yeah. you know it's okay. people that don't know the art. Okay, and it's very important to. That's, to that was my last my last ghost because the other one I'm gonna I think will come up later. Okay, so I I think let let's watch the movie so uh, people can see the art that is in the gallery and and then we can continue the conversation with our guests. Thank okay. you.
So now you, you have uh, been able to see a little bit more about the exhibition. Our first uh, speaker, in fact, is a very, is a very special uh, one because uh, uh, she was at the Cape Cod Community College uh, not long ago. Uh, she's an alumna and her name is Alejandra Cuadra Sanchez. Alejandra, I'm so happy to see you here and thank you so much for joining us. So Alejandra, you were my student just a few years ago and uh, you took my fiber fashion art course and you were already extremely creative. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna say a few things about you and then I'm, I'm gonna let you uh, talk about your work. So Alejandra is a persistent and sensitive human a maker, a dreamer, and a believer. Her roots are grounded in her homeland, Peru, and the United States, where she currently dwells. Alejandra produces the world through the rituals of making installations, video, reappropriated objects, sound, intuition, and a desire for freedom. Through creativity, she has gained a voice and a place of belonging. She seeks ways to discover empathy that can transcend walls and barriers through communication, art collaboration, and community. So Alejandra graduated Maine College of Art with a BFA in, in sculpture and a public engagement minor. Welcome. So maybe you are muted, Alejandra. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, well, I feel really honored to be here and sharing this space with all you all. Um, I think you said a lot of things about me, um, but I think what this show really encourages is the activation when thinking of like myself as a sculptor, as a maker, and thinking about the space that we navigate in um, through, the, it's, in, it's about thinking about the activation of energy, activation of voices, and the resiliency that that can have. Um, and I think that's what I try to bring into my practice where I speak about um, myself, but also connect to uh, communities and conversations uh, centering around immigration, um, a very current political topic of this moment. Um, but I, yeah, I think in itself in allowing myself to speak about it, um, it not only gives me hope to realize that I'm not alone, but also realize that um, there can be more action and action and activation and activism um, can be seen in different ways. And I think that's the power of art and I guess in a way also the power of this um, exhibition in itself, very beautiful. and to see the multiple of voices and energy and people uh, want to speak and collaboratively. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think Tom will put up some images of, of your work uh, soon. Uh, and, and what was really uh, wonderful about hearing that you wanted to join us today was because you, you wanted to bring your, um, your best um, art activist uh, bodies. Oh, so here, here is uh, some of Alejandra's work. Do, do you want to talk about it a little bit, Alejandra? Yeah, so like I said, I use found objects and also objects that I create in different uh, mediums and think about the narratives of the past and connect it to the narratives of now and how um, there's different aspects of human connectivity. And um, I think for me, the heart plays, the symbol of the heart plays such an important role because 
it, what, it is what is inside of all of us. At the end of the day, um, that is what vibrates, even if people have different political views and perspectives, at the end of the day, the heart beats for themselves or for their family. So I, yeah, I think that's a very predominant case and this is an installation. So there's a heart vibrating and sounding and activating that space where I, my hope is also for the viewers to feel, um, feel something. So, so you, you, you made that installation using a suitcase. So I, I assume, you know, there's, there's the idea of always being on the go. Um, yeah. So that has a poem about um, myself as a DACA recipient, but also as an immigrant and thinking about displacement and like always being uh, pre preparing for the worst, but hoping for the best, but always having it half open, half full. Yeah. So uh, um, I, I, I think we, we might be some other photos, but um, yeah, so here, here is an, another one. You, uh, so this, this, this is a, a detail, right, of uh, the installation, right? Yeah, uh, that's a, a flag that I made out of steel. Um, and thinking about the barriers and borders of the actual flag itself, but also the barriers and borders that are happening in the border, um, in the border along Mexico and um, the U.S. and how there's like a limitation on human migration, but there's also like going to start being a like a limitation on um, other species like the monarch butterfly who also represents immigration. Mm -hmm. And this is thinking about my body performing and with the actual documents that I have to sign and um, that I carry or that identify me as uh, a recipient, but also connecting it to where I come from. So the headpiece is based off uh, the Cantuta flower, which has a ritual that is of coming of age, connecting it to the DACA um, and this, the youth and the perseverance and resiliency that comes out of that. Um, yeah. So, so tell me now about uh, your friend, uh, Athena Lynch. Oh. Athena, why, where, I don't even know where it's Welcome, welcome <laughs> Athena. But I've been very fortunate to have attended Maine College of Art and graduated with an incredible class of artists and everybody that was there and ha is still there is really have f f made a huge foundation and the friendship that I've developed with Athena and also Ashley that you will see later on um, has continued to inspire me. They, um, so Athena is a multidisciplinary artist and her, from the foundation of having her grandmother and her um, and mother making to how she interacts with the world and even makes even the food. So nurturing, nurturing the, the self and others and also connecting and speaking. Um, she's a person to be reckoned with. She was, uh, she's from New Jersey um, and um, she works in sculpture. We say the sculpture is working with space in many different ways, um, but it's also really connected to community outreach and has done a lot of different public engagement art projects um, in Portland. Um, I, th I think Tom, you, 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 I think you have some images of uh, Athena's work because that, that's that's still um, what we are seeing right now. It's still uh, Alejandra's. Yeah. So he, here is Athena's work. So Athena, if you want you, to, you, you want to talk, talk, Athena, do you want to tell us about your work because you you are you, at first you were not supposed to be here, but you are here, so it's fantastic. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, uh, I can't see my uh, part of my screen, but that's okay. Um, so I'll just talk about the image that you're looking, you all are looking at right now. This piece is currently up in 
Congress Square Park uh, here in Portland, Maine, and it's called Altered Space. And this piece was inspired um, in regards to like just kind of like all the pain and frustration and like just tumultuous energy and anxiety that's been kind of swarming around with the deaths of so many people that have occurred uh, like over the summer that still continue to happen. And I wanted to make a space that essentially gave people an opportunity to just kind of like pause, breathe, reflect, meditate, uh, set intention, and like really just kind of try to quiet themselves and just try to like shift that energy into more peaceful and more calming and more positive um, energy. And like the other two images that you are looking at right now is a chalking uh, project that I was doing over the summer. Well, yeah, over the summer. Um, there were a lot of protests going on and I, I work with um, immunocompromised people, so I can't be in large groups. And so that was kind of like my way of protesting and using activism. And so what I did was I was going around downtown Portland and I was just chalking various quotes from different people across time, activists, artists, musicians, um, political. How, how, how did people react to your work? Like, um, when they, when they started just... to read the message? Um, yeah, I had a lot of people that would stop and, and, and inquire about what I was doing or ask me what I was writing. Um, one of the quotes that I was writing when I initially started was a quote by Malcolm X. And a lot of people, when they think of Malcolm X, they think of like this, um, this agitator, this provocateur, you know, someone who was very violent or, you, you know, quote unquote, black supremacist. And the quote that I was writing was very contrary to what the, the general public may know about him. And so a woman had stopped and asked me who said it. And I said, uh, Malcolm X. And she just kind of paused for a moment and was like, oh, okay. So <laughs> she was just kind of like surprised. And I think, cause like I said, like when we think of Malcolm X, we think of the by any means necessary. We think of the image of him holding the AK-47. We don't think necessarily about the softer and the more calmer side of him. And so like one of those quotes I feel as though was more so like from that side of him. And so this is just one of many because I was pretty much like almost all over the downtown area. I did chalking in the park. Um, I did a lot of chalking in high traffic areas. And so I wanted there to be high visibility. And we're, we live in a time where everything, everyone is so focused on that tiny little screen that they, they shove in their back pocket that they talk on, call the phone, that these quotes force you to stop and look away and actually focus on other things outside of that screen that you're constantly staring at. And so that was the other uh, purpose behind the chalking. And so this right here is from where I was actually chalking in Congress Square Park. And um, yeah, you actually showed another image from a from the Juneteenth event that I also put on in Congress Square Park. I kind of have a good, a special relationship with this park. So that's why there's a lot of events in this park. <laughs> um, this was a Juneteenth event. Um, a lot of people don't know about Juneteenth. And so putting on this event was a way of just kind of like getting the public engaged with uh, knowledge and the history of what Juneteenth is. We also, I also made it an art making event as well. So what you're looking at is that one of four tables that were set up in the park where people had an opportunity to actually do block printing, block printing on bags. Um, I, I partnered with a couple of social service, well not social, yeah, but yeah, social organizations, social activism organizations in the city as well. And we also had a local printmaking company that also, she has a mobile unit. So she was also partnered. And so she had a, like her mobile setup um, in the park as well. And she had people screen printing on t-shirts. And so this was just about getting people aware and knowing about like what Juneteenth is and just kind of 
also taking that opportunity to spread information and having an opportunity to get out. And it was very, it was multi-generational, uh, different skill levels, and it was, it was, uh, it was successful. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for sharing that with us because, uh, you know, we are far away, but I was following the news and uh, it looked like uh, youth was very uh, um, stepping up and I, I was happy for that, about that. So uh, tell, um, tell me a little bit about Ashley. Oh. Ashley, uh, <laughs> Ashley Page, who is here. Uh, who has recently done a couple of public art projects in Portland also. Uh, Ashley, um, you are on, right? Yes, hello, I'm here. So you Ashley is originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is also the epicenter of one of the unfortunate tragedies that has occurred over the summer. And so having being directly from that area and actually being in that environment after that situation happened. Um, she took some of that inspiration and brought it back with her to Portland. And she created this amazing banner project uh, that she installed in Congress Square Park as well. Um, also an activist, also a superwoman, like the woman that introduced me, Alejandra. Um, all around dope person. <laughs> A uh, good friend and Ashley, do you want do you want to do you want to share a little bit with us your your experience as a as a community organizer, a social disruptor, uh, an interdisciplinary artist? Um, of course. So, hello. Um, thank you for thank you for having me. Um, and Alejandra, thank you for having thank you for inviting me to this conversation. Um, so my work is largely, you know, inspired by not only my own experiences, but that of others. Um, I really consider, you know, my work and, and what I create to just be a reflection and a way of processing um, the world around me. So that means that, you know, it's, it's integrating materials, um, found objects, um, pilfered things, and reimagining you know, the black experience and the black body and black portraiture into um, either representational or abstract, um, abstract manifestations of, of what these things look like. And so the project that's on screen right now is called Daughters of the Dawn. Um, and that is a, it was a paper making project um, in which I took images that were from a book just labeled Africa. Um, and I always found that to be so odd that an entire continent can be summed up by like if looking through the lens of, 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 an, of the Western, looking, looking at Africa through the lens of the, of the Western gaze. Um, and so there is a puppeteer to the top right of the image um, and it's over these women who were preparing for a bridal ceremony. Um, and there were flowers that I pressed from, from a garden. Um, beautiful. Thank you. And this one is called The Body Remembers. And so this was from the same series and from the same book. Um, actually, this one is a woman who was weaving a basket. Um, and so I exactoed out like the rest of her body because I wanted to focus on her hands and her face and the concentration um, because I find that um, basketry and ancient craft techniques and, and textile um, you know manipulation is something that's so innate to the body um, and it's something that's another part of my practice as well as basketry and fiber um, and, and textile craft and it's something that it's one of those things where the body just kind of takes over. And so I was really curious and interested about generational memory um, and, and bodily, like what does your body, what generationally does your body carry? Um, and whether or not that's, that's trauma or that's knowledge or that's um, ingenuity, you know, um, really thinking about what kind of lives have we lived in the past and, and how do we manifest those and the ones that we're in presently. Um, and so that's what that project was about. But the project that I most recently did is actually right behind me. Um, 
This project was called In Memory of Those Taken. Um, so this was after, um, you know, I was back home in Minneapolis, Minnesota um, at the height of the COVID quarantine shutdown in March, uh, March through June. And um, through during that time that I was home, um, you know, I witnessed the city uprise um, over the or following the murder of George Floyd and the amount of energy and unrest and and just the like just nobody is taking it you know and everybody um, recognized the injustice for what it was and everybody took a stand and so the energy that that you know catapulted out of everybody was so amazing um, and this was a project that stemmed from that. It started as a wheat pasting project in which I took the individual portraits um, of these individuals and I wheat pasted them all around the city. And it, it turned into this final project, which is um, three 12 foot banners that hung in the park um, to, you know, to pay an ode to those, to those who have had their lives lost due to racial and police brutality. Um, and so it's really, you know, paying an ode to these particular individuals, those who have spanned um, throughout, throughout their lives and our lives. Um, but also it serves as an acknowledgement of those who we don't know um, and those whose, whose stories have not hit the mainstream media. Um, it's very moving, extremely you. moving. Thank you for, for making those pieces extremely yeah. powerful. Yeah. Um, this one is pupa state. So um, it is kind of that idea of, of craft and of how to reimagine um, a body and the body and what is a vessel and um, the vessel as a body and what do we hold and what, what do we have internally as well as what shapes us from our skeleton and our skin um, and what do we carry. So this was wax dipped crochet um that was stuffed and then hung so these are about the size of a torso um each one and it's just an exploration on craft and portraiture so thank you thank you so much yes so i would like now to invite uh, cheryl jaffe uh, so cheryl jaffe finds fiber light and water and air essential to everything from art making to connections of all kinds, as well as survival. Her artwork uses, uses fiber um, from plants, inks, paper making, and what's not to express the awe of life on this planet. She currently directs the Wellfleet Historical Society Museum, where she hopes to make more connections. Welcome, Cheryl. Thank you, thank you. Um, I just have to say the all the work I've seen in the last 15 minutes has been very inspiring, really um, incredible. Alejandra, Athena, and Ashley, <laughs> really inspiring work. Um, so um, the the pieces that you see here are. Um, came out of the um, Basho's Pond. Um, some of you may know the, the poem, the old pond, a frog jumps in, kerplunk. And there's, there's a lot of different interpretations of that haiku, um, but one um, important one is the idea of transformation. And I see the, the frog as a symbol of transformation. Um, frogs have also been seen as the sort of the canary in the coal mine of our planet that um, frogs take in air and water and as of necessity, those things must be clean for them to be healthy. And if they're not, they're um, one of the first creatures that will show signs of decay and um, destruction. Um, the, the piece that's 
on the screen right now is um, the title of it is what do you see little frog so um, this is what the frog sees <laughs> from the perspective of the frog in the pond um, maybe the underside of the leaves and the the planets as they're passing through their orbits uh, over time. And the other important aspect is that of transformation and vulnerability. Um, and the materials are fibers, all handmade paper made from different plants that um, sometimes use ink, sometimes the color just comes from the different plants and frogs get transformed from the little polywogs. In the, in the middle of this piece is a, a series of little, little frog eggs laid on the giant leaf in the center that then become um, little polywogs that swim around and then become frogs and, and so on. So transforming of a of a frog's lifespan i see is symbolic of how i'm hoping that we're able to work together and transform the planet through compassion kindness and um and love thank you cheryl so we thank now I'm, I'm going to welcome a, a, a guest uh from the west coast Jennifer Bloomer. Hi, Jennifer. So Jennifer is the founder of, of Radici Studios. Are, are you on, Jennifer? Oh, I'm not sure she's on. Um, can you Jennifer? hear me? Yes, I can hear oh, you now. There we go. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. So Jennifer has painted and taught art in Guatemala, Chile, Italy, uh, Eritrea, Kenya, Thailand, India, Colorado, and California. Uh, you are speaking to us from California right now. And uh, you believe that using creativity to share our truth and the act of listening to one another's stories are an essential, an essential part of a more equitable world. Um, and so you live uh, in San Francisco and uh, you're there with your husband that happens to be Eritrean uh, Italian and you have two children. So tell, tell us more about um, your work. Yeah. Thank you, and I'm I'm so honored to be here today. I have been just so impressed with um, what the other artists have had to say, and um, feel it especially um, grounding in this moment to um, connect with other makers and creators. And um, it's it took me some time to really um, come into my um, identity as an artist. I did art growing up, um, but had um, it, it was challenging for me to see the path forward. I didn't have a lot of exposure to activist art and um, was really um, kind of changed by the experience of becoming a mother. I have a six-year-old and a three-year-old. Um, and suddenly it put my life into perspective of, you know what, I, I know that art is a calling of mine and I need, um, I need to really um, believe in, in the importance of this work. Um, so... I've been creating art um, uh, and actually doing, I guess the images you're seeing right now are some murals that I've been doing. My art is very focused on um, stories and the way we convey who we are um, and the importance of understanding our roots and where we come from um, and, and listening to each other's stories. Um, I think that that's a really powerful way for us to connect to one another um, and to, to create change, the needed change in um, the world. Um, and so some of these pieces you're seeing now that they're, they're done on cardboard. Um, so they're, they're actually physical protest signs um, that I started making 
um, a couple years ago and um, I wanted to create um, something beautiful on something that people are throwing away, which is, which is car cardboard, um, but also was, was using them um, and to use them to, um, to go speak and voice the change that I feel needs to, to come in the world. Um, and my, my husband immigrated here from Italy and his parents immigrated from Eritrea. So that's a big part of um, something that feels very personal in our family. Um, but also um, this one here you'll see, and I don't know if you can see me, I can't see myself. So I don't know if you can, this is just an example of the piece you're looking at. They're all done on, on just pieces of cardboard here with Sharpie and acrylic paint, um, simple materials. And um, my goal with my art is to look at the ways that we can, um, yeah, come together as a community to reflect. Um, I think that art um, has a really powerful opportunity to shift people's hearts and minds in a way that talking uh, about things doesn't always um, do. And so um, I'm looking at ways that, um, I can um, reach people through through the art. Um, I use social media as a tool to share out there um, in the world and um, really find um, you know it powerful to um, be able to. Um, I, I think growing up, I saw a lot of boundaries around um, these these um, galleries where you had to apply and try and get in, and it feels like in um, today's world with the with um, the online world and, and social media, you can really get work out there in the world, get your voice out there in the world. It feels much more accessible to me um, now, which I think has been um, something kind of interesting. But um, I also, I wanted to share um, the other day, we're, we're in um, San Francisco, as you mentioned, and um, we, um, I'm sure you've all heard, we've been having terrible, terrible fires out here. Um, and the other day, um, two weeks ago now, the, we woke up and the, the sun never rose. It was bright orange sky all day. I mean, dark orange sky. We have had to have the lights on in our house the entire day. And just such a scary thing in your body to feel like this thing you always know is going to happen, which the sun is going to rise, um, just never happened that day. And um, it was really kind of a wake up call for me in terms of, oh my gosh, um, you know, the world is, feels like it's ending today. Um, and how do we make, keep this sense of urgency with us? Um, and all of these issues are, uh, sorry, I feel like I'm rambling a little bit, but I, I see all of these issues tied together, immigration and um, anti-racism work and the way that we treat each other and the way that we um, treat our environment. <laughs> What's that? The way we treat the planet. The way we treat the planet, exactly. So, um, you know, having that, um, having that kind of, very visceral realization that things are actually changing. We are um, needing to, to come together very urgently, urgently here has, has really stayed with me. And it, it also kind of reinforced my feeling like, you know, if, if the world ends tomorrow, I feel like I'm doing exactly what I'm, I'm meant to be doing. I feel, I feel very strongly that the arts are our means of, of creating change um, and that we all need to find our place within that. Um, so um, I'll just finish up saying I'm so inspired by the artists who've shared here and I, I just um, feel so, um, you know, in, uh, humbled um, to be a part of this and grateful for you all to, to put it together because I think we need more of this. We need more community. We need more spaces for people to share their perspectives and, and to motivate each other to keep going. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And in fact, the next person is going to be a naturalist, an artist and naturalist. And her name is Mary Lou Blakesley. Um, and Mary Lou Blakesley uh, takes people to remote, wild places in the world. Uh, as a contract naturalist on uh, National Geographic small boats, expedition cruises, she presents a climate presentations to adventure travelers in varied destinations. So uh, Mary Lou, do you want to talk to us about that experience of uh, uh, maybe watching the, the ice melt on, uh, 
on the north of the planet and the south of the planet? Um, Mary Lou, are you on? <coughs> Mary Lou? Oh, I don't know what happened to Mary Lou. Oh, here she is. Now I'm muted. There we are. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. All right. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I've been very fortunate to spend a great deal of my life out in the wilds of this world. And Tom, if you could go to the image that's in the show of the whale, I'd love to start there. So the image that I have in the show is this, which is the eye of a baby gray whale. And the title of this piece is Looking Back, because so often when we're out in the beautiful wild world we come back and say I saw this and I saw that and and I got to see a whale but this image is that the whale saw me and my work is about what the wild world sees in us because it is watching it's watching us and it's affected by everything that we do and although many of these uh, images that I'm showing are maybe not what's in your backyard or um, outside in the ocean that goes by you. This is also home in the larger sense of that home and how climate is affecting us isn't just right here in our yards and in our neighborhoods, but it's also everything that's happening in the world. I loved that people talked about migrations because these whales are going to be off the coast of California that's burning. And so the ocean is also absorbing the carbon dioxide from the fires. It's, it's just an uh, amazing time and also a time to think about all of the things that are happening that are affected aside from ourselves, which is powerful and difficult enough for certain. Uh, Tom, if you could go to the next one. Um, so also there's, images that I have in here from Southeast Alaska, where I've spent an incredible portion of my life. And the ice is just such a beautiful, natural art form in and of itself. But it is also looking at us, you know, it, trapped in this ice is the history of the planet in the little tiny air bubbles within the ice. And as the ice melts, so too does that history. It's just, it's evaporating in front of our eyes. Um, which is, to me, also an incredibly powerful and beautiful uh, image of itself and of the world. And I would like to finish with the last one. Um, and this is, last one is not my photo. It's of somebody else took it because that's me driving the Zodiac. Um, I've been fortunate enough, as I say, to go to these wild places. But this image I just love because... I'm in this Adelie penguin's world. And this Adelie penguin jumped into my world. And here we are in this place where if I were to leave the confines of that zodiac, I would not be able to live. And that little, little bird cannot live in my zodiac for very long. But here we are looking at each other. And that's really what's happening in the world, the natural world is in communication with us whether we're paying attention or not. It's watching, it's needing to um, find its way to survive by what it is that we do. And just sort of as an ending, I wanted to also mention things that Alejandra talked about. There was an image of the monarch butterflies. Right now, all over North America, so no matter where any of the participants or maybe the viewers are, there's the migration that's equal to the wildebeest and the zebras in Africa that's happening in North America right now, and it's flying over our heads. There's a huge migration of birds, hundreds of thousands, millions of birds all over. So they're going down the eastern seaboard, they're coming down the middle of the country, they're coming down the Rockies, they're going down along the California coast, and all of them with those tiny little lungs are inhaling the smoke in its tiny particulate from these fires. So it isn't, it isn't just us. I spent last week in the house because you couldn't see the mountains outside the window because of the small particulate. I certainly didn't have the experience that Jennifer had of not being able to see outside and turn your lights on. 
But for two days, we're in a drought, of course, and in from Saturday and Sunday, the rains came, and so it cleared up a little bit so I could go outside and breathe. And one of the farmers nearby, who was also waiting for the rain, um, burns his fields uh, after they harvest the corn. And so mm -hmm. of those two days, one of the days I again could not breathe because everybody waiting for the rains and needing to do what they feel they need to do uh, took we, away. We're going to continue to talk a little bit about fire with uh, Ellen Lebeau. Uh, we were supposed to have like a little break uh, with uh, Kim Moberg and music, but I think we're going to go directly to Ellen because okay. uh, time is, is passing really quickly. And I think we'll have music at the end. Uh, so uh, Ellen... Um, you made this uh, amazing series of plague doctors paintings. Uh, so uh, Ellen Libo is a master of black and white images. She uses the difficult medium of carving through a thin layer of black ink to a white substrate. Uh, it's a little bit like an etching. And so uh, basically, Uh, I would say that your subjects um, range widely, but uh, sometimes, especially uh, right now, they are a little bit apocalyptic visions. Uh, you also, uh, you, you are very inspired by people, by nature, and, and mostly by, uh, you spend a lot of time in, in uh, IT, maybe not right now because of COVID, but you have been uh, living uh, on IET for, for many years. So first, I'm, I'm just going to let you talk about uh, those plague doctors, and, and then you can tell us a little bit about the, the art community that you founded in IET that uh, is called Matenwa. Sure. But yeah, while, while everyone was talking, I just have to start by saying one thing about this show. Um, thank you, Mary Lou. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? She can sure hear you, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm sure. But, you know, I just, just came back from Virginia, state of Virginia, and I, I just had to write this down. I was witnessing a lot of people there who were getting too comfortable in their un unexplored fear of a nameless other. And, you know, Cheryl talked about the universal goal of compassion and kindness and love. And I think it's, we can only practice this if we grasp that every single person affected by what's going on is an individual with a purpose and a name. And that's what I find so profound about this show is its focus on We're not just a big mess, or just a planet. Um, name by name is how we're going to learn love and compassion and kindness. But other than that, um, yeah, I've been kind of obsessed with the idea of the plague doctor. Um, during the bubonic plague in, uh, in Europe, Uh, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, there were certain people in certain communities that were kind of assigned the task of going from home to home, seeing afflicted, uh, maybe helping to treat them, tallying up the numbers, burying the corpses. They're called plague doctors. And because they were so, um, because they were so close to the contagion, an outfit was designed for them eventually, like, almost like a hazmat suit. It was very strange, uh, historic figure. It was a costume with a big black hat. Uh oh, I can't. And a full length coat that was smeared with some sort of suet to keep out uh, infection. People understood And understood that it was carried in the air, but they didn't know how. So, so he was completely covered with a, a kind of beak-like mask that was stuffed with herbs so he could breathe something that wasn't infectious. His eyes were covered with 
with glass circular coverings. He had a, a cloak. He had these pointed leather gloves and shoes and he was, and a stick that he would use to poke people so he didn't have to touch them or beat them off or whatever it was. He was the strange archetype of witness to me as everything was falling apart in Europe and all the death and fear and change and destruction, this image just, it just hooked into me as, again, like an archetypal witness of a frightening vision only from his, the inhumanity of his cut offness from the, the people whose doors he was knocking on. Everything was in a sense on fire, uh, funeral pyres, were burning, um, towns were burning, people were, were accusing each other of, of infecting each other. At the same time, things were disintegrating to a place where things had to start all over again at one point. I don't think we're right there yet. Do you, he, want, uh, do you, do you want to start to talk to us a little bit about um, you projecting uh, Matinois? Yeah, I could talk about the plague doctor forever. So I will go to Matinois um, about 25 years ago or more. Cheryl Gaffey and I actually went to this island off the coast of Haiti called Mat uh, Lagonave. And very remote part of Haiti. We wound up in the village of Matinois, which is up in the mountains. Those are my two guide children who live with us now. Um, and we started a project with women in the village we started with paper making, but it evolved into other kinds of artist, artist work that women in that village could do to make some money. And it evolved over the years into from eight people in the village to 40. It's a place where there's no running water, there's no electricity, there's no doctors, there's no cars, um, there's just subsistence living. And the women in the community have, by doing this work, have become real voices in their, in their families, in things that are going on you know, politically, culturally. It's changed their lives in a lot of ways. Right, right now, it's kind of at a standstill because of COVID and how we can't get to them or bring their products back and get them sold. But it was life-changing, totally for me and Wellfleet <laughs> and Cheryl. Great. Well, that's a, that's a wonderful uh, um, thing that you are doing. And um, one of, one of, I wonder if we can put maybe um, a website uh, on the, the gallery uh, website in order for people to have more information about Matanois. I'll give you that. The image that you have in the show is of Ba. It's a traditional Haitian art form made with what with sequins and beads. Dambala is the voodoo god of life. He's, he's, an, he's an image of a snake and he's married. He's the, the earth image of life and he's married to Dambala Uedo, which is the rainbow. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Ellen. Um, I think uh, I would like to ask Daniela if she would like to, oh, yeah. to yeah. share a little yeah. bit of uh, um, uh, the fact that, you know, Daniela is a nine-year-old vegan climate activist. So for Daniela, food justice matters and environment matters. So uh, Daniela, I know that you, you are an amazing artist, uh, you make all these beautiful drawings. And I, I was wondering maybe if you could uh, um, share with us uh, your view about uh, what's happening today, uh, what you talk about with your friends, um, what you, you, you are wanting to do um, to make the planet uh, safer. Um, hi. Last year, for the climate strike, 
I wanted to point out that climate change is not a far away problem. That even on Cape Cod, we are seeing the effects of climate change now and in my future. The goggles and snorkels were to express the extreme problem of rising sea levels. I met Marnie, the photographer, at the climate strike and, and then did a photo shoot by Wellfleet Harbor. And this is the picture I drew of Ruth Bear Ginsburg. And it says right here, I dissent, you can't spell truth without Ruth. And, and she's a very important person to me because she worked for women's rights and she was a very good Supreme Court Justice. And here's another one. I made this for Earth Day. It says, Save the Earth Now. Oh. So, so, so tell us a little bit about um, your diet. So you are vegan. Is it something that you, you share with you, your friends? Because I assume your friends might eat chicken or... Uh, might uh, mm. eat maybe some beef. So what, what do you tell them? Well, a lot of my friends eat meat and dairy. And one of my teachers in kindergarten was inspired by me of being vegan and her and her daughter became vegan and I thought that was wonderful because more, I love being vegan and when I was five I asked my mom where does ice cream come from and she said from a cow and I decided that I would be vegan, and since then, it's been a really good, it's been a change in my life that I've, that was is it, very was it, important for me. Was it a decision that you took on your own, or was it something that your mom was already doing, and then you felt like maybe that was uh, something you wanted to do too? Um... Yes. <laughs> so so is, is mommy vegan? My mom and my sister is vegan. And my sister is four. She and... So, so you know, I have the same situation in my family. My, my uh, grown-up kids became vegan. And uh, uh, I used to always... Uh, say when they were little I, because that when they were little they were eating some meat and I would always say well you know when you guys are grown-ups I will become a vegan and they would always say mom you know that's not even true and and then now they are vegan and I am more like a vegetarian because I'm still eating cheese I'm still having eggs uh, but I, I'm not having beef or um a lot of red meat I, I, I don't eat anymore because like you, I feel that I, I want to do something for the planet and uh, it's something that is easy. I just have to change my, my recipes and, and I will be healthier being vegan than eating meat. So uh, thank you so much for sharing with us. And uh, I'm, I'm going to introduce now Bob Henry, um, that is a painter. Uh, uh, Bob Henry uh, explores the possibilities through drawing and painting and every day uh, Bob Henry draws uh, in fact improvis improvisationally it's, it's a tough one to say <laughs> through these variations he seeks to come up with compositions that reverberate that's um, 
between quotes. Um, Bob was born in Brooklyn. Uh, he has been living on the Cape now for uh, quite a while. Um, he uh, exhibits his work in his own gallery in Wellfeet, but also at uh, Birta Walker in Provincetown. And um, he has a beautiful um, kind of uh, very worrisome at the same time painting in, in, the, in the gallery that is called Be Calmed. So be uh, and calmed with an ED at the end. And uh, we can uh, see this man in, in the middle of a, uh, a hurricane or, or giant uh, waves are about to take him away, but he's relaxed and uh, he seems to um, remain zen. So Bob, t tell us more about uh, this painting and also about others that uh, are inspired um, by the, the same subject. Okay, let me start by saying how moved I have been by the quality of the art and the artists uh, who have uh, who are participated in this exhibition and this uh, uh, video, and also to their commitment uh, to uh, to the world, to the planet. Um, uh, I uh, I am I'm an oil painter, is what I am, or. Uh, or a painter, I'm, I'm devoted to, to uh, painting as, as a occupation. Uh, and uh, the way I, I work is I play. Uh, when I uh, give advice to my students, my, oh, my advice always is to say play. Uh, and, uh, and that's what I do, I play around with the materials uh, and with composition, and then these images happen to appear. Uh, and it's rare that I intend a meaning uh, in the paintings that I do, but uh, uh, after I do them, I realize there's a meaning, and sometimes I get into series, uh, and when I'm doing the second work in the series, uh, then I know uh, kind of what the meaning is. So I. I, I really do hesitate to put it into words because I know that every viewer uh, brings themselves to the viewing of the painting and they see it uh, for themselves. It's a different experience for every person who looks at it. Uh, so the um, uh, Be Calmed, uh, I, I, I like puns. Uh, and I remember uh, years ago going out into uh, Provincetown Harbor with a friend who claimed he could sail and he couldn't. Uh, and we got out there and uh, we got becalmed. And uh, a boat from Boston was bearing down on us. Uh, and I thought we were in for it, but uh, somehow we managed not to. But he did manage to hit the one stationary object in the, in the harbor, which was uh, a gas barge. And I remember the guy sitting on the barge looking at us and not believing that, that we went into that one thing. But in any case, so uh, uh, the, this painting uh, rose out of other paintings, uh, which started with uh, uh, a man swimming, uh, but enclosed in a boat. Uh, the, the eccentricity of that is what, uh, is what took me. Uh, and I like that feeling of eccentricity. Uh, the other paintings um, all have to do, that are, uh, will be on the screen, uh, have to do with water. And, uh, and I seem to have an ability to paint water uh, from out of my head without looking at it. Maybe that's from making many trips uh, uh, from uh, Woods Hole to Martha's Vineyard where I summered for many years and looking at water uh, for a long time. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I'm thinking of uh, Mary Lou Blakesley's work, uh, which this work reminds me of a little bit, a photograph of the eye of the whale and the idea of that eye looking at us uh, from out of the water, which has this quality of being so mysterious uh, that we can see the surface, we realize it has some depth, uh, but we really can't see the depth. Uh, there's uh, 
symbolically, that just is something that combined with the fact that I have the, the ability to work with water is something that I use in a number of paintings. Uh, so this painting is the first painting that I did from a series that I called The Ship of State. Uh, and when I started this painting, it didn't start as a boat at all. It, it started as a mound uh, that I was looking down at where, uh, after uh, planting plants in my garden on the vineyard for long. And I thought, what a good idea for a painting. Uh, and then I did it and it just didn't work at all. So, so the idea of metamorphosis comes into my, my uh, way of working. So I translated that mound into a boat. Uh, and then I, uh, I saw the possibilities of people in the boat and people trying to get into the boat. Uh, and, uh, and I think what I had in the back of my mind had to do, of course, that, those paintings were done back in 1992. And I think what I had in the back of my mind was uh, the, the Cuban boat people and the Vietnamese boat people uh, and that, uh, that idea of uh, uh, being uh, in this unknown medium and somewhat safe in the boat and, and, the, and not letting other people in, which of course has, has lots of echoes in our current uh, immigration policy. Uh, but I didn't know that. I did this 30 years ago. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think another thing that I might say about my work is a lot of it has to do with vulnerability. And, and why I'm so attached to vulnerability, I don't know. I come from a privileged background. I, I haven't been uh, vulnerable in the way so much of the world has been vulnerable. But nevertheless, somewhere uh, in my... Uh, Somewhere inside my being, I have this feeling about vulnerability. Uh, so this one, I don't know how it came about, but a, an innocent uh, uh, flying and, and soldier shooting at him. Uh, and uh, the title of it is Shoot at Anything That Flies. Mm. Uh, so I think that's enough about my work. Thank you. Well, th thank you so much, Bob. I, I would like now to introduce our musician, um, she's going to play live music, and the name is uh, Kim Moberg. Maybe uh, some of you know her already. Uh, Kim, uh, you were born in Alaska. I was. I was born in Juneau, Alaska, and I am a member of the Tlingit tribe, which traces our origins back almost 2,000 years in the southeastern Alaskan area. I am so very happy to be here um, not just to play a song for you guys, but to, to be able to experience your work is, has just been so moving to me today. So thank you so much for um, inviting me to be a part of this. I, don't, I find it just absolutely incredible and so full of hope because, um, you know, I watch the news every day and I just see day after day, minute after minute of all the negative things and to see um, just the beautiful artwork today and, and the coming together through art is fabulous. I'm going to play a song for you that I wrote. Um, we are living in some tumultuous times for sure, but um, I truly believe that no matter what side of the political fence we're on, deep down inside, everybody just wants and deserves the same things, and that's acceptance and respect. So I wrote this as a tribute to the people who came before me with the courage and the conviction to stand up for what is right and to resist what is wrong. And that's what you guys are doing now. It's got a chorus, I'm gonna teach it to you, and I know that um, we can't sing aloud, I won't be able to hear you, but I'll be able to see you and I'll be able to feel it in spirit. So I would love it if you joined me from wherever you are, okay? The chorus goes like this. I'm not willing to close my eyes I'm not willing to accept the lies. I'm not willing to compromise. And that means compromise on the truth. To this, we'll all sing, resist. With empty pockets, and hopeful dreams they set sail on a stormy sea 
facing danger and poverty to see that light of liberty Stolen land and broken treaties They left their lives at wounded knee Their sons and daughters as many years Still fight the white man to keep our waters clean Here we go So I'm not willing to close my eyes And I'm not willing you accept the lies I'm not willing to compromise to this I say resist that's it I can feel it they built a railroad so slaves could flee with a proclamation, you are free. Then they marched in Selma for the dream, spilling blood for equality. Out of the closet, finally, but they paid the price for living honestly. Beaten and tortured so brutally For the crime of loving, of loving differently Here we go So I'm not willing to close my eyes And I'm not willing to accept the lies No, I'm not willing to compromise So I'll stand up for freedom And I'll sing out for peace I'll speak out for justice To show my children We can do better than this Try to stop us just to feed their greed, building walls that come between. But we'll work together to realize a dream and to build a nation on true democracy. And so I'll ask you to stand up for freedom. I beg you. Speak out for justice to show our children we are better than this. Last chorus, everybody sing with me. So I'm not willing to close my eyes, and I'm not willing to accept the lies. No, I'm not willing to compromise. for all of your work. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, we are better than that. We are. I know we are. And you just you just proved it. I, I would like now to uh, ask the audience if they have any questions. Um, 
So um, I, I guess you can uh, maybe uh, type your question in, in the chat and then we'll see it. So um, thank you so much, everyone. It, it was a, an amazing event. Uh, I had no idea uh, how things would go, but it seems like it went pretty smoothly for everybody. <laughs> do you, do you want to share a little bit more, Kim, about um, um, your uh, experience of um, living here on the Cape, about the community? Uh, about the fact that I, I read that you were playing guitar like since the time you were like 14. I was. I started playing. My mother was a classical pianist and she um, had to give lessons. She decided to give lessons to the kids in the neighborhood. And to earn my lessons, I had to type up the lyric sheets to um, the songs that she was teaching the students. But I had suffered from debilitating stage fright and um, couldn't sing out in public. I was just too nervous. And um, after a career in uh, banking and working for a couple of years for the International Fund for Animal Welfare, which has its world uh, headquarters here on Cape Cod, um, I became a stay-at-home mom and decided to try and overcome that stage fright. And now I've got a couple of CDs that have been recorded by a Grammy-nominated producer that um, is here on the Cape. And um, I tour and... Uh, now this is what I do. So, Denya, please remind us how to access today's event again. I'm looking at the comments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I see that people have, have questions. I see, dear Natalie, thank you for making this happen. Also, what are the options for coming to see the show live? Uh, I, I will have to ask uh, the administration of, of uh, the school. Um, I, I see also um, some uh, question from Lee Roscoe uh, to contact Mary Lou. I will make sure that uh, people uh, get in touch with each other because that's your purpose of, of doing this today. Uh, we are doing it um, for us, for our community, and uh, we want to grow um, the group. We want to grow this wonderful, creative world uh, and change the planet, change what's happening. <laughs> we want it to be contagious. So I, I would like to, to thank everyone. And also, uh, if you Natalie, there's like a hand up, actually. Tom, Tom I, I would like to thank you so much because you, you have been behind uh, the scene and you have made it possible uh, for all the visuals and for everyone to enjoy this wonderful uh, event. Um, so uh, anybody who would like to, to say something, please. Annabelle Wong has her hand up. I'll, I'll unmute her. Okay. Hi. Um, so I was nervous to do this, but um, I actually, I'm a student at Four Cs and I didn't know about this until Professor Schaefer told my English class this morning. And I was very excited because this is the exact topic that I'm doing my honors contract on in my cultural geography class. Great. Um, so I am creating a database of um, climate and art from around the world. I'm trying to get art pieces and music and dance and any kind of form of art and put it into a database and um, make it uh, it's not going to be public, I don't think, because I don't have permission from all the artists I'm using. So it's just a mock database for academic purposes. But um, if any of the artists who presented today, if any of you would like, I would be honored if you guys would let me put your art in um, this database. And also, I have a couple of things to say to a couple of the artists because I was absolutely blown away. Um, and I just wanted to, I, w I have a couple of questions, I guess. Um, and they're kind of too long to put in the chat, but um, I am really, I was wondering, Alejandra, if you had seen the exhibit at the ICA in Boston um, on immigration, the exhibit that they did, there was a lot of found object sculpture there, um, and it was all focused on immigration, and it was incredible, and I was wondering if you had gotten a chance to see that. 
No, I have not. I have heard and seen so many great uh, pictures and heard a lot about it. I unfortunately have not. And I don't honestly don't know if it's still up. If it is. It uh, wasn't. It was last year. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think I, yeah, I didn't make it to it, but I've seen really, really incredible work from it and um, really inspiring in so many ways. And I have another question for you. Um, I love, so I'm, my focus is I'm an art history student. I want to be a curator and um, I want to go into fashion eventually. And I loved the garment you made. Um, And I was wondering if you have any like specific interest in making textiles and fashion work and stuff like that, because that's my passion as a curator person. So Yeah, I... I have like a background more in like uh, ceramics and I love steel, but I've been thinking more about textiles and thinking about uh, the weaving of it and what like what that and within textiles, there's the notion of text. So combining and weaving and um, arranging objects and materials together and I'm think I've been really inspired by um just the cultural like craft that happen that it's from Peru. So it's something that it's on my mind and something that I hope to work with sometime soon um for an exhibition coming up. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um Athena, I just put down a bunch of exclamation points. I was taking notes on my phone while while you guys were presenting and Athena, you just, I just put down a bunch of exclamation points because I thought your work is such an important thing to happen because um, just to have that space to reflect and it's, I just think that's incredible that you turned that into art and not just like something that's online that people see and that they actually have to physically take part in. And your Malcolm X story was great. Well, thank you so much for your questions and what I what I see more if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Okay. So um Ashley, I also absolutely loved your work and I was I'm going to a protest tomorrow, um in in regards to the Brianna Taylor decision and I was wondering if I if you would allow me to use one of your art as and I would credit you obviously on my protest sign. If that, if you could, if that's any way possible. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, Annabelle, thank you so much. That's so sweet. Um, I would be happy. Yeah, feel feel free. Um, if you want me, I can directly either you know email you a file, or they're not up on my website, but they're up on my Instagram, and I can put that okay. in the. Um, I'll just follow you on Instagram because that's something I should do anyway because I love your art. So. <laughs> Thank you. That was really sweet. Well, I, I, I would like to thank um, everybody, uh, mostly our speakers, um, our um, wonderful uh, musicians that uh, made the music for the video, our uh, video artist, Jennifer Muller, uh, who made the, the film. Uh, Kim, thank you so much for this amazing song um, and for hope. Um, So I would like to uh, say that um, we're going to end this, but uh, we want to stay in touch and um, I'm open to your ideas. I'm open to uh, doing more events and uh, let's keep it going because um, Uh, We want to um, help um, the planet as much as possible. And uh, uh, we want to stop the violence uh, um, against um, people of um, um, black community or uh, whatever community they are, people who are different. So let's stay in touch. You can reach me. through uh, the college. Uh, you can reach me at my email, which is uh, n, uh, like Nancy Ferrier at uh, capecod.edu. And I can, uh, I guess, type this for everybody. 
Um, and so, and and so then we'll we'll uh, keep the conversation going. So a, a big thank you to everyone, and uh, I'm hoping to to see you soon.